Okay, can I just ask everybody to sort of come in and take their seats? So I want to jump right in because our time with the Deputy Secretary Knives is limited and uh, he really needs no introduction. You have his bio data here um, on, your, on your chairs. Uh, we're really delighted that he could take time out of his busy schedule to come over and talk with, with all of us here in this kind of informal way that we, we do it. Uh, uh, I'm going to turn it right over to you to make some introductory kind of remarks and then hopefully have at least a little time for Q's and A's and then I understand that uh, uh, Barbara will be able to continue on afterwards. Uh, Barbara's our Deputy Assistant Secretary for State Programs, Operation and Budget and I know she's an uh, expert guru on it too. But Deputy Secretary, thank you for coming and you know, it was a big you have one of the most, I guess, difficult portfolios to deal with right now. Uh, but I want to turn it over to you to talk a little bit about budget. Where well, we are and where we're going. Well, thank you very much. And listen, I, I appreciate all of you uh, coming. And I, um, uh, I'm still, I'm still young enough in this job um, uh, to be kind of in awe. Okay. And I, and I'm a big cynic, so you should assure you that I'm not. Uh, I don't go. I don't get to awe very often. Uh, having had a fairly diverse background, having worked at Capitol Hill, and then spent the last decade working on Wall Street. I guess I can't admit that anymore, but I did work uh, 10 years on Wall Street. Um, I, um, uh, having, having been in government, having been back in government for you know a bunch of years, coming to the State Department uh, was a real awakening to me. Um, not because of what uh, people would do all day, but the quality of people that I I began to interact with, and I don't. I'm not just saying it because I happen to be in a room of you know current former you know foreign service uh, officers, but um, I, sometimes I don't think people recognize the immense um, quality and the kind of diversity of the of the people that I've had an opportunity to, to interact with. And what's interesting is is that um, you know in government sometimes people say, oh, it's you know no one wants it. it's. It, it, no one's innovative, and they're stuck in their ways, and uh, they don't want to take risks, and um, you know, you keep getting done. It's it's just not true as it relates to the State Department. It's certainly not true as it relates to the Foreign Service officers. I mean, obviously, I adore all the employees that work in the State Department: the civil service officer, the civil service, and the, uh, and the locally engaged. But you know, as it relates to the conversation we're going to have, I'm talking a little bit about the Foreign Service officers because. In my view, is it's a um, the the because of the way it's organized. And I really, quite frankly, didn't really know this when I came in. But the, but the, you know, it's kind of an upper all culture in some respects. I mean, you're moving all the time. You're you're, you're going to different posts. You're moving around the world. And as you as the promotions happen, um, your career enhances. And at some point, you like everything. It's like you reach the ceiling, and that's a good place to be because at the end of the day, um, it's a motivator. And as I travel around the world, I have been astonished about the ability to not only uh, interact with people who have been in six, seven, eight posts, have been the, been the econ officer, have been the DCM, they've been the political officer, they've been the ambassador in multiple. It's, I mean, again, I, as someone who um, now is 51, I no longer um, get uh, too excited about things. Uh, but I just have been become the one of the biggest promoter of what you all do, and it makes my job a lot easier because I believe in the mission, and not because I happen to work for a spectacular Secretary of State, but uh, I just become <coughs> realize that the the role that the Foreign Service officers played on our national security uh, is really critical to what we do. So I'm I'm honored to to be part of this team, and I am honored to kind of be the advocate. As you know. Um, I don't know. When I took this job last January, I was uh, safely ensconced, as I mentioned, uh, at a, my, my former investment a bank that I worked at. And when Secretary Clinton asked me to do this, um, I said, well, Sec Madam Secretary, what, what's my job? What am I going to do? She said, well, I've got a few things I, are on the, on the plate, and so let me, let me just say, here's the things I want you to focus on. I need you to focus on Iraq, because we're doing the largest transition since the Marshall Plan. Uh, I need you to focus on Afghanistan because we have an enormous amount of resources in Afghanistan. Uh, I need you to focus on Pakistan because that's a 
that's an enormous, you know, it's a frontline state and he's with the Kerry Luther Berman money, it's a huge amount of activities. And oh, by the way, um, I also need to kind of work on the, do the budget and just make sure we have the advocacy on the budget. So let me be clear to you, I've never wanted to work on Iraq, Pakistan, Afghanistan more, uh, now knowing that I have to also work on the budget. So uh, in, an environment where, in an environment where that's been pretty difficult, I, the, the enjoyment factor for me to work on the front line states has been really interesting. I've been to Iraq uh, three times, I've been to Afghanistan twice, I've been to Pakistan twice. I've really not only been exposed to what we're doing on the front line states, but it's also been a, a, a real uh, understanding of the importance of what you all do all day, but the, the intersection between uh, diplomacy and defense and development, as the Secretary calls the three Ds. And I, you see it up close when you're in Afghanistan and Iraq and in, in Pakistan. But I can talk a little bit about that uh, later in, my, in the conversation that Q's made, because it's really fascinating, because it's not only a huge amount of resources that the Department spent, about 20% of our budget is actually focused on the frontline stage, which is good and bad because obviously it, it takes resources from other things and energies from other parts of the department. It's a pretty important world out there, but nonetheless, it's an important part of what we do. Um, I wanted to, to, to kind of give a reality check of some of the, as it relates to a little couple minutes on this budget issue, because I think it's something we all uh, need to think about a little bit. Um, uh, first of all, I think um, this system and how we do our budgets, um, I know it's going to be shock to all of you. It's a little screwy. I know that's a diplomatic term. Uh, but, you know, I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's hard when, I, was, I say to Barbara Russell, who's, who works with me uh, quite closely on a lot of the budget items, but only, only in America would, you, we, would, we, would we figure out how we're spending our FY11 money now, okay, FY11 money. We were debating 2012. And we're trying to explain the justification of our FY13 budget and beginning to plan our 14. So I mean, it's it just it, it, it doesn't it doesn't make a lot of sense. It, it, it is unfortunately the reality in which we live, right? So we end up having this scenario where you're you know you're debating one year, you're starting to plan it on another, you haven't spent money the end, and then all of a sudden you get these huge pipelines. It becomes a very complicated and mind-numbing experience, and it's. It, People like you all who have been, are in the Foreign Service or have been in the Foreign Service and say, God, can't they get their act together at the State Department? Why can't we figure out what we're doing? The reality of this is much of this is out of our control because much of the decisions that are made are made by the Hill. And because of the way the appropriations processes work, it is what it is. But it is, it is something we all have to get used to, something I've had to get used to. Poor Rob Goldberg or Barbara who come into my office and say, "Oh, Tom, we got to start the plan in 2014." I'm like, "Are you kidding me? I had just I just presented the 13 budget and I'm not even spent the 12 money yet. So, no, I'm not talking about. It. Of course, I capitulate and I go ahead and do it. But there's there are um, I wanted to mention there, there there's four kind of truths. I, I don't mean this in kind of in a, in a um, a lecturing sort of way, but I there's four things that I've kind of learned since I've done this now for almost a year and a half about the budget process. The, the first thing is, is that you know this better than anyone. We do not have a large constituency for the State Department and the USAID. It just doesn't exist um, for a whole variety of reasons. Um, and I can go into a lot of details why it doesn't exist, but the reality is it's hard to go and stand up, uh, a member of Congress to stand up in Dubuque, Iowa and, and defend uh, the State Department, USAID's budget. There are some members of Congress who do it, uh, but there, the problem is if you ask the question, and I've now I think I've pounded this into people's heads, uh, but when you ask the average American how much money we spend in the State Department, USAID, Gallup surveyed this, and said, ah, I don't know, 22%, 24%, as, as you all know, um, I only wish it was that high, as you all know, it's less than 1% of the federal budget for everything we do. So that is, you know, for every uh, employee, every building, every piece of assistance, assistance to Israel, Afghanistan, Pakistan, is less than 1% of the budget. I will, from a, using a banking term, that's a pretty good ROI, as I say, return on investment. But even with all of that, we still don't have um, a, a, great, a great constituency. I do blame ourselves for that a little bit, to be honest with you. This is not, I mean, I don't think we have done as good a job uh, as we should have and over the years about communicating what we do for national security, what we do for the world. Um, we nowhere near what the Defense Department has done over the years and built a long, huge constituency as relates to defense spending. Um, I think it's probably because we just think our work will show for itself and, 
they'll see all the good things we do and we'll get credit for it now. Or maybe we still like pat ourselves on the back very much as an institution. Uh, but I think we're getting better at it. But the most important truth is, is that we do not have a large constituency. But that said, uh, for the constituency we have, they're vocal. And that's my second truth. We do, however, contrary to conventionalism, we do have a lot of friends on Capitol Hill. Um, I'd like to say we're not necessarily going to change public opinion that 80% of public is going to say spend more money on foreign assistance, okay? That is not going to happen. Uh, not when people uh, are hurting uh, for jobs and their houses are underwater and their 401 k is worth substantially less than it was. I mean, that's just not a natural thing. And I've been involved in politics enough to understand that all of you have. Um, you know, that's what people care about. And, uh, and understandably, but we do have friends on the Hill, both on both sides of the aisle. I mean, really thoughtful people. Um, you know, like senator like senators like Lindsey Graham and, and Pat Leahy uh, and Dick Luger and and people like uh, uh, Kay Granger and Nita Lowy and, and John Kerry and you have really really intelligent focused members of Congress on both sides of the aisle who quite frankly have been unbelievably helpful to us over time and it was very helpful to us during this major budget crisis or or. or or um, uh, uh, negotiation we just went through in 2012. My third truth is, is that, and again, this is going to sound a little self-serving, but I'll do it anyways. Um, um, fortunately, we have uh, Hillary Clinton, and I and I mean that only. I mean, obviously, I work for her, and I and I have a lot of respect for her. But make no mistake, her credibility on Capitol on both sides now has a huge amount to do with how we've been treated recently. Our our budget. Um, I don't care if you're a Democrat or a Republican. I don't care if you're conservative or liberal. People finally believe that she's done a very good job. And the reality is she has. She's, there's no better advocate, in my humble view, for the men and women of this department. I mean, she fights for it every day. She believes in it in her core. And she works the phones, OK? So it's good to have good speeches and do little stuff. But she'll get on the phone. She'll go up the hill. She'll do the work she needs to do to make it happen. So that's the third truth. And the fourth truth. Um, is really what I said at the beginning. We, we don't do a good enough job patting ourselves on the back and advocating. And that's something that I know your organization spends a lot of time on. It's things that we start, we think about a lot, and we need to do a better job in, in the future. So that's kind of the fortune. So let me just spend just a couple minutes on the, on the numbers. So just, I'm not going to bore you with a lot of numbers, but I just want to make sure you understand the scheme of things. So 2012, as you know, was kind of a hellacious year. Um, the, the State Department, USAID, um, were caught in this, uh, this vortex of the, the whole budget debate and all that that was going on. And I was quite worried about us getting really hammered in 12. Um, we, we actually um, we came out OK. I mean, we got cut, obviously, from what the president asked for in 12. But we got about $50 billion in 2012. Um, the, you know, again, about 20% as the frontline states. But it's, you know, that was about 6% below what the president requested, but again, I'd like to say it could have been a hell of a lot worse. Uh, the House, I should tell you, in the first round was probably around um, $43 billion. Okay? And through a variety of work with the Senate, and quite frankly, then the House working with the Senate to their credit, so they came up with about a $50 a billion dollar number. Um, you're going to hear a lot about this, and it, not that you need to spend a lot of time thinking about it, but as you know, for the first time, we have a national security budget, which is, in, which is really interesting. And one of the things that meant was to keep everything talking about national security, which has been our theme for a long time. You can't just talk about the State Department, USAID, as a um, uh, development budget or a diplomacy budget. It's got to be about national security in an environment where money is tight. Some people don't like that because they see, oh, well, we can't really talk about national security. No, we have to, and we have no choice if we, if we want to sustain the gains in which we have, which we have achieved. And a portion of that budget of the $50 billion, about $11 billion of the frontline states. So Iraq, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and 12 is really uh, in the frontline states. So in, in just not to, to, again, bore you with a lot of numbers, because that's not necessarily what my objective was, but we're spending about, in 12, about $5 billion in Iraq. We're spending about $3.5 billion in Afghanistan, and about $2.3 billion in Pakistan, just to give you an idea of the, the scope of the numbers. And then we have, obviously, um, the initiatives. As you know, the Secretary's been very, very focused on the initiatives. And uh, global health, which is one of the three big initiatives we did, is a big part of our budget. That is the PEPFAR program, which I give uh, President Bush an enormous amount of credit 
for establishing and putting it on the map, and I give this administration a lot of credit for sustaining that and continuing to grow. But that's about, you know, about $8 billion. We have a Feed the Future initiative, which is really important for those of you who spend a lot of time in this area. Uh, that's about a billion dollars. Then we obviously have our client, climate change initiative, which is about a half a billion dollars, which obviously many of you know how important that is. So we, uh, you know, so for 12, I felt okay about it. I mean, it's not, you know, obviously we had to make some cuts and decisions. One of the decisions we made, and which is something close to your heart, is about, it's about the hiring of foreign service officers and civil service officers. As you know, the secretary uh, uh, made a pledge to increase foreign service officer by about 25% in her tenure. We're sitting there around 20 to 21%, which is not bad, I should tell you. Um, you know, will we be able to get to 25% at the end of this calendar year? The answer is probably no. My goal, to be honest with you, was to sustain a 20% increase, right? And so not to decrease that. And remember, that means, you know, people, as they leave and they retire, we've got to replace them, and we have money in the budget to do that. So that's kind of the... The goal that we laid out is something that we will sustain. So then we go into 13. Um, 13 is actually, that's just the budget we presented. The president presented a budget, as you know, about a month ago. It was about 1% above what it was in 12. Not bad. I mean, it's probably, probably the only budget that actually went up a little bit. About 1% rate of inflation. But again, I'm, you know, I'm a, uh, you know, I'm a pretty uh, um, practical guy. Uh, I think um, you know a, a one percent uh, increase for our at least going in uh, is an important part. So that's a that's again something that we will be working on. It's about fifty one billion dollars, and I will be needing your help to really be the advocates of the thirteen budget. And I should tell you, my assumption is the chance of getting a budget through the Congress this year with the camp, with election is probably not great. Uh, but nonetheless, we will still be talking about what we need to do. So, um, so the so the budget to me is. Um, is manageable, but we need to prioritize and continue to focus on the things that are important to us and quite frankly make sure what's important to, um, to uh, the secretary. And there, another, I just want to spend just another minute just to make sure you all understand what we're doing uh, in the frontline states, and particularly um, in Iraq, because this is really where uh, this department has really <coughs> stood up and really shined as it relates to um, something that we've never done before to this level. Um, and I've been quite worried about it, to be honest with you. And I, I've been really impressed by the, by not only Jim Jeffrey and the team out at, at Baghdad, but Pat Kennedy and the team here. But as you know, we're doing the largest transition since the Marshall Plan. Um, you know, if I would have told you a year ago that we'd be in a situation where we would have no military in Iraq come December 25th, 2011, most of you would have said, oh, that's ridiculous. I mean, I know you signed an agreement, but that wasn't going to happen. We have no military uh, in Iraq beyond some advisors who are doing the work on the, on the FMF cases. So the reality is the State Department has basically stood up a, the largest embassy in the world. We're in charge. And, and, and I can't explain to you how complicated that is. And the credit of, of Jim and his team, uh, we're doing it. And we're playing a major role in a very important part of the world. And I am proud to say, having just been back, the, the efforts on our foreign service officers are, and civil service and locally engaged folks is beyond heroic. I mean, it's still a little dangerous, uh, but to be able to do what we're doing. And then, at the same time, we are talking about how we normalize the embassy. So you build up an embassy of this kind, and you're going to decrease it over time, which is an important thing to do. You read a lot about Afghanistan, and again, the President has announced a transition in Afghanistan in which we're sticking to that timetable which is, as they say, a process which will get to um, uh, a turning over security to the Afghans to the Afghan people by 2014. And that will be an ongoing discussion as we uh, begin to draw down our troop levels. And in Pakistan, for those of you who served there, you know, uh, over long periods of time, it's a complicated relationship, but it's an important relationship. It's an important bilateral relationship. We're going to have a very strong bilateral relationship with Pakistan. We have our fits and we have our starts. We have our complications. But at the end of the day, we want to have a very, very strong bond relationship with the Pakistanis. And that's very important to any reconciliation we have in Afghanistan. You must have that relationship uh, with Pakistan. And then finally, one of the things that the Secretary has asked me to spend time on uh, is this thing called economic statecraft. I think you've been reading about it and hearing about it. It's nothing new to those of you around the, uh, around the room. You've been doing it for, for you, know, uh, you know, years as a relation to promoting 
American jobs here, but one of the things that the secretaries really focus on is with the unbelievable need of, of job growth in the United States, we, the State Department is uniquely positioned to drive uh, the jobs diplomacy uh, in these countries. We are the place to come to. We have a thousand econ officers around the world. And I love my friends at the Commerce Department, but they don't have anywhere near uh, the numbers of people, more importantly, the cachet inside the countries as we do. So we have had an enormous amount of focus on job diplomacy. I like to joke about it. You know, we have a, two missions, peace and prosperity. This is the prosperity part of the agenda. And it really is true. And it serves us to really focus on that. So we're kind of retooling what the econ officers spend time on. You know, we talked about ambassadors as the CEOs of their missions. We're talking about that they should be waking up and thinking about how they promote U.S. jobs every day. We set up all sorts of things. In fact, uh, last week, we had the first uh, ever global business conference in the State Department. And we've always had business conferences. But this conference, I invited, or we invited, um, uh, a representative from every uh, country we had a post. So 150 uh, countries came. And most of them were the, were the chairmen of their the local AM champs. That, and they were so dual had it. So the, so the president of Boeing of Japan is also head of the Boeing AmCham team. And so we had 150 countries represented. And so I had the whole cabinet came, the vice president came. It was really a terrific way to talk about jobs, diplomacy, and the importance of intersection between jobs and economics, or, or diplomacy and economics. First of all, it's a good story to tell the Hill. So it's not like we're blind to the fact that this is an economic issue, it's also a diplomacy issue, but it's the right thing to do. And it's quite frankly, we're really good at it. That's an important part of it. So why don't I uh, pause um, and, ju and just to say again, I I'm honored, uh, beyond honored, uh, to, to, to work in this institution. Um, I don't need to tell all of you, because you've been there and done it, and a lot of you still do it. And um, for those of us who've never done it, um, sometimes I don't think we ever step back and reflect how cool this place is. Uh, so from my perspective, um, it's a great honor. So why don't I? Uh, take whatever questions I can answer, and I won't answer a part one answer. So, why don't we go ahead? Thank you very much, and let's go to the questions. We've got one back here, and then we'll come over. Yeah, thank you, uh, Secretary. I'm Charlie Clark with Government Executive Magazine. Uh, just a question 